What's up? Today I'm going to be going over concrete column design in seismic regions. This is going to be according to ACI 318-14, members not part of the seismic force existing system. I'm going to be providing you a simplified workflow worksheet and also some sample calcs, an example calc, along with a worksheet that you can input uh, variables yourself, kind of like a spreadsheet if you know how to use MathCAD. So I will be going step by step on how we do this in the industry, and I'm going to try to simplify it as much as I can so you can see the bigger picture and what the code's actually trying to say. Because I know when I was first learning it, going through the codes, it kind of feel like a wild goose chase. I'd go through this code, and then it'll make me go to another code section, and then I couldn't interpret what the code was saying, and then I think I figured it out. Then it makes me go to another portion of the code, so I'm trying to simplify all that. Hi, I'm Matt Picard and I'm a licensed practicing civil engineer in the Southern California area, specializing in structural engineering design of buildings. And I also make structural engineering career videos similar to this one. Let's jump into today's content. Let's first go over some of the differences between non-seismic columns, uh, columns in high seismic zones, and special moment frame columns that are part of the lateral force resisting system of the building. So as you can see here, the main differences are basically the hoop spacing. The low seismic zones, uh, you can usually get away with a lot of hoop vertical spacing. In high seismic zones, even though they're not part of the lateral force resisting system, your typical gravity column, they're going to have a good amount of reinforcing uh, stirrups and hoops, as you can see here. And if you have a special moment frame column, you can tell that it's going to have a lot of hoop spacing basically spaced at around two and a half inches, as you can see here. So what's the difference between these, the low seismic zones and the high seismic zones? Why are there so many hoops and stirrups here and so less in low seismic zones? Well, one of the main concepts is ductility. Essentially, if you have an earthquake, your floors are going to displace like this and your columns are going to displace with it. So the more that your columns can displace, without basically breaking, that's what we call ductility. So what these hoops do is the more hoops you have, the more ductile, the more your column can deform laterally similar to this. So what this whole ACI code section is trying to do is trying to show you how much reinforcement that you need so you can have this type of behavior. Because if you don't have enough reinforcing, your columns will, uh, under seismic loads, fail similar to this if they don't have enough of this hoop reinforcing. All right, so let's go into the actual design process of per ACI 314 or 318-14. This is a simplified flow, ch uh, flow chart that I made. This one, it's actually included in the PDF in the description below. This is a simplified one without all the comments, but I'm just gonna make comments here just so you can keep a better track of where we're going. So. It all starts with section 18.14. Members not designated as part of the seismic force resisting system. Essentially, you're just gonna be following the code and you're gonna to need to satisfy a few key sections to satisfy this type of requirement in high seismic zones. So the first thing is they're gonna make you find the loads, your axial loads, they give you a load combination. And then they're gonna give you an option. The code's gonna give you an option, whether you want to check the displacements like so if you have like a, a lateral model where you can find the, the earthquake loads and you can find out how much the columns are going to deflect under the earthquake loads and you input those earthquake loads let's find the forces that means you're actually checking displacement or you can choose not to check displacements say you don't have enough time to check displacements or you just don't want to well the code is going to be a, a pretty much a lot stricter with you they're basically going to make you design it and detail it as a special moment frame because you're not checking it. So they give you a pretty big penalty. So instead of your column looking something like this, they're gonna make you detail it as a special moment frame, which is gonna have a lot more uh, hoops. In the industry, there are some times when we may want to use this. So for example, you may have too many different columns uh, in your project to check and it's just gonna take a long time and it's not gonna fit within the budget or you could have same thing with an expedited schedule. You just don't have enough time to check all these calcs. Uh, some other times you might not want to check it is if you have a extreme torsional building where you're going to have high displacements or displacements are going to be pretty high. And there's other things too, but for the most part, if, especially if you're in a normal size building with a low to medium rise, 
you're probably gonna wanna check the displacement so you don't have to do all this uh, additional reinforcement. So in the industry, what does checking displacements actually mean? It, it basically means that you're gonna have a, a lateral model, you can do, a, there's a lot of frame analysis software, you can have your ETABS model and check the displacements and then apply your displacements to a, a frame analysis model. There's a lot of different ways to do it, but basically you're gonna apply this inelastic displacement here, and then you're gonna find the shear and moment forces and the axial forces when you're actually applying those displacements to the frame and to the column. So how does this actually look like when you're doing the calcs? I've included a worksheet here. It's a MathCAD file, but it's also in PDF. Uh, MathCAD's pretty easy. I have a link to it. So all these things that are in yellow, it's basically a spreadsheet that you can just edit the things that are in yellow. Uh, manual input, all the things that aren't in yellow are gonna be an automatic calculations. And I'm actually doing a example here. So in case you get lost with any of the numbers or whatnot, you can actually see what that means. So for example, when we go back to our checking the displacement model, uh, once we have our analysis model and we apply those inelastic displacements, we can find the moments and the shears and the axial forces in that particular column. So let's go back and let's say we have all those forces there. Now we are going to satisfy 18.14.3.2. So what is this? And like big picture, what is this trying to tell us what to do? So I just made these diagrams here so you can see what the actual code is actually saying. But for the gist of this, this code section is basically trying to tell you to, hey, check the strength, check the displacements. Basically, it's just a, a strength check on those imposed uh, moments, shears, and, and axial forces that are from the lateral displacements. And it also wants you to do some additional detailing in terms of longitudinal and transverse or hoop reinforcing. And it also wants to make sure that you're designing your column for the maximum probable moment and the design sphere that can develop in the column. And they have another check just to make sure that your column is properly confined if it's a, a really heavily loaded column. So let's dig into these codes a little bit deeper just so we can understand where all this is coming from. So the first one that we have to satisfy is 18.14.3.2. We basically have to satisfy all of these. This is the code section where it's telling you to check the strength. And again, in the spreadsheet, I have all these uh, pretty much done for you. You have the moments and the PM interaction diagrams. Those are checked with the existing column as long as the, sh the shear checks in both directions. We have this P0 check here also that's required um, over here. So we do all these checks in this, this worksheet. So if you get lost or if you don't know what something is, this goes into pretty much all the numbers that uh, you need to go through in case you're not sure what the procedure is. So once you check this part, then you're gonna go to uh, part B, columns that satisfy, or columns that satisfy 18.7.4.1, 752, basically all these additional requirements is where I mean that the code's gonna make you jump around to different types of codes. But it's a lot more uh, intimidating than it is, you kinda just have to take it step by step. So let's just do that. So 7.4.1, what is this trying to make you do? This is just the longitudinal area. If you've taken your basics in concrete design class and you design a typical concrete column, you should already be familiar with what this is. It's a pretty, what this is, it's a pretty common check. So not gonna go too deep into that, but 7.5.2, this goes into a lot more of the seismic detailing. What's different in the, in seismic zones is they make you do a lot of 135 degree hooks and you have stricter spacing requirements in terms of where your ties can be or what the limit is on them. And these are pretty self-explanatory. If you go if you go and read through them, if you've taken the your concrete basics, you should know how to check these. The thing that you that stands out is this check, this PU check. Well basically this act it's basically if you have a heavily loaded column it's going to restrict you even more. So your HX shall not exceed eight inches. Uh, HX is basically this, your spacing between your ties. And the other one, here we go. Every longitudinal bar around the perimeter of the column shall have lateral support provided by the corner hoop or by a seismic hook. 
So basically, you can't have these anymore. You can't have a 135 degree hook and a 90 degree hook. If you need to do this, you're gonna have to hook everything. Basically, everything's gonna be a 135 degree hook. Basically, this hook is for a seismic core confinement. If it's, that's why they call them seismic hooks, basically. They, they basically confine the core more than if it was a, a 90 degree hook. So if you have a heavily loaded column, it's gonna make you do that. And it'll look something like this, where everything's about 135 degrees, for this column example at least. So the next part that we're gonna be checking is 18.7.6. We're basically gonna be checking the shear strength uh, the design shear force by finding uh, MPR, the maximum probable flexural strength. So what does this all mean? It basically means that you're gonna have your column cross section like this, and what the code's gonna make you do is they're gonna make you find the maximum amount of moment that this guy can take. They're basically making you yield the column and design the stirrups for it. So what the procedure is, at least in the industry and the way I've done it, is basically making a PM interaction diagram with FY equals 1.25 times FY, the, uh, the longitudinal steel. Why do they make you do that? Why do they make you make a PM interaction diagram with uh, a bumped up FY? That should actually be FY right there. So that's a typo. Like I said, they want you to yield the column and and what happens is why, why that 1.25 is there is because let's just say our typical longitudinal steel yield strength is 60 KSI. That's the specified yield strength that we specify in our drawings and what the manufacturers are gonna do. So this is the absolute minimum that they can go to. So the manufacturers, the steel manufacturers, the fabricators, they're not gonna make this as their, as their standard. They're gonna aim higher up because all these dots are, let's just say, if you, if the manufacturer went with aim for 60 KSI, they're gonna have things around there. These are the strengths that they're manufacturing. Some of them are gonna go below the standard and these are gonna get rejected by us, the, the structural engineer of record. So what they're actually gonna be doing is they're gonna aim something more like here. So they're actually, when we specify 60 KSI, they're actually gonna aim something around here. And this is gonna be the actual strength of the probable strength of the longitudinal steel once they're out there. And the stronger your longitudinal steel, steel is, the more capacity it has for bending. So that's why they make you do this other PM interaction diagram where your, your moment capacity and therefore your shear forces that you're gonna be applying to the columns are actually gonna be higher. So over here we found the axial force and make sure that the reduction factor is zero on your PM interaction diagram and that's how you find your maximum probable moment. And in the spreadsheet that's also shown, I believe over here. Yeah, so we find the maximum probable moments in both directions and we find the shear that's related to that. And that's based off of this diagram right here that, that that's provided in the ACI 314 or 318. And there's also another check that you need to check over here, but I'm not gonna go too much into it. Basically, they're saying if, if you have enough axial force, they're basically gonna say, hey, your concrete shear strength is gonna be zero. Uh, that's an easy enough check to do. That's also in the calcs if you wanna get into it. So once we satisfy 18.7, Point six, we have some more detailing requirements over here that we're trying to check. That's pretty self-explanatory. That's also in the calcs. I've also explained it here. But we're going to have to satisfy all these requirements too, just the spacing of uh, the stirrups and hoops. And then finally, the last thing that we're going to be checking is part C, columns with factored axial gravity loads exceeding 0 0.35 P zero shall satisfy this one, which we just did. And they're also gonna make us satisfy 18.75.7. This one, if you meet the, for a typical column, they're basically just saying that, hey, we don't want you to have so much concrete cover. I think they're saying like, if you have, uh, was it four inches of cover that, or, or you can't exceed that, Looking at our column, we have one and a half inch cover. So that's by default and most columns are gonna meet that requirement. So most of the time you don't really have to look too much into this. 
basically they're saying they don't want you to have so much cover because during an earthquake your cover is going to spall and it's going to fall and hit somebody or or cause damage to, to property if you have like a four by four inch check of concrete falling. The last code section that we are going to check is 18754. And what this section is trying to do is make sure you, you have enough confinement in your columns, basically making sure that you have enough hoops. And they're gonna make you meet this requirement if you don't meet this 0.35 P0 requirement. Basically saying if you have a really high axial load, like say you're almost at capacity in terms of axial, they're gonna make sure that you have enough confinement in your column. So this is what the code ordinance looks like. You can read some of the commentary here. This is basically based on a lot of research and testing. What they found is, you know, once your column goes into high lateral displacement, let's just take this for example. I'm just gonna paste that there. So let's just say if your column displaces like this during an earthquake, this is a stress strain. So let's just, for example, let's just say this is the breaking point. So once it displaces this amount, your first hoop's gonna fracture. And that's just from displacement compatibility. Your columns are going for the ride of wherever the diaphragms uh, take them during an earthquake. And what they found in the research during testing is that if your columns go into high displacement, high lateral displacement, even before they reach uh, their first hoop fracture, a lot of the concrete core is going to start spalling off. And you can kind of see here, if you don't have enough hoops, a lot of the concrete core is going to be gone compared to a well-confined concrete core with a lot more hoops uh, in between. So obviously the more core concrete that you have, the more capacity your column is going to have. So that's what they want with these confinement requirements. When an earthquake hits, you're not gonna have that much concrete in your core. So they're gonna enforce that you have enough of your hoops to keep your core well confined. But at this point, these are easily put into a spreadsheet. Uh, they're basically plug and chug. You plug in the, the formulas and you just check those. And these are located in the spreadsheet. Also, you just check those different types of expressions. You kind of just have to rearrange the equations to solve for max spacing. And you basically just check all the spacings and you want to find your final hoop vertical spacing. So at this point, you're gonna have your final column design. You're gonna have your transverse spacing. This is gonna be five inches and you've already checked your longitudinal bars. Those are going to be eight number nines. And if you're in the, in the industry, just because you have your calcs done doesn't mean that your design's done, you're gonna to have to put them on your plans and on your drawings. So what will those look like? If you can go onto your, your slab plan or somewhere, you're gonna to have to call out the columns somewhere. This is just gonna be an example. We're calling this one out as a CC19. And on most projects, there's probably gonna be some type of concrete column reinforcement schedule as it goes up through the building. This is where the contractors can find out exactly how much reinforcement is where. And for this example, this was a CC19, and let's just say it was on this floor. So it was gonna be a 14 by 14, uh, 14 by 20 column with number four hoops and ties at two and a half inches on center. This is just an example. This isn't the one that we did, but this is just to show you that you need to show this on the plans. And this one calls out a detail, a section detail, and you're also gonna have to show the detail similar to this in order for your design to be complete. I'll be making more videos on how to break into the structural engineering industry and how to become an awesome engineer once you do. So make sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell so you can be notified whenever I post a new video. Also make sure to check out the Structural Engineering Podcast where I'm a co-host where we interview actual structural engineering professionals about the industry and how they've succeeded in their careers. Make sure to find the link in the description below. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you and I hope you have a great day, a great career, and a great life. I'll see you next time.